So over the years, I've noticed there's a lot of athletic teams that um, they put on their, their team shirt or their team jacket a, a motto or an inspirational um, saying. You know, and some of you maybe are familiar with that. And many times it's a statement they've adopted for that particular season. This is our, you know, this is our motto for the season. This is what's going to keep us going. And um, I, th there's a few of them I thought I would share with you this morning. Maybe you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about. So I, I've seen this one. It says, we leave it all on the field. Or it may say, we leave it all on the court. You know, but, but the whole idea is, man, when we go out, we play with everything and there's nothing left when we're done. We just spend it all on the court, right? Um, another one I've seen says, um, built on blood, sweat, and tears. You seen that, right? And, and you look at that and you go, wow, sounds kind of messy. Um, but, you know, the idea is, man, we work hard. We just, again, we just give everything, all our blood, all our sweat, all our tears to make this team happen, all right? Um, another one I've seen says, um, eyes on the prize. You know, maybe it's a, a team that's uh, uh, almost won the state championship before, or maybe they've won it several times before, but to keep focused, man, we want our eyes on the prize. And there's like they emblazon that on, on all their team gear. Um, another one I've seen that kind of stood out to me was no fear, no limits, mm -hmm. right? What's that mean? Well, we're not afraid of anything, and that means because we're not, there's no limit to what we can do, right? And, and maybe some of you saw some of those and you go, oh, I, I thought we came up with that. Uh, no, these are just kind of sayings that are out there that sports teams pick up and they like to emblazon, and uh, some of you, I'm sure, have seen these before. But several years ago, I was at a wrestling tournament, and I saw one I'd never seen before. And as I'm, I'm, as I'm walking through this gym, I see this guy in front of me, and on the back of his shirt, he has this, it says, rocks feel no pain. And I was like, well, that's very interesting. I've never seen that one before. And the idea, you know, just kind of help you out if you're not understanding where this is going. The idea implied there is, is that um, this particular team, uh, they're like rocks. And they, like a rock, they don't feel any pain. So inflict all the pain you want, but it's not going to matter because we're like rocks and we don't feel any pain. Well, I was, I was with one of the kids on our, on our team, and he saw it too, and he goes, oh, coach, look at that. Rocks feel no pain. Oh, that's kind of cool, huh, coach? And I said, yeah. But what if it's not true? And he looked at me, kind of a puzzled look on his face. And I said, what if it's not true that rocks don't feel pain? What, what if rocks do feel pain, but they can't express themselves? And he looked at me, and he got a big smile on his face. He goes, oh, coach, that's a good one. <laughs> Maybe they should change their shirt. Rocks can't express themselves. <laughs> Well, I've looked for that motto ever since then, never saw it on a t-shirt. But you know, maybe somebody should pick that one up, right? And uh, it was kind of, it was kind of a, a unique uh, situation, and we both just kind of chuckled at you know, the deep philosophy behind that. Um, but, the, but the reality is, both of, those, both of those mottos are true, right? Um, rocks don't feel pain, and Rocks can't express themselves. They're not animate objects. They don't have life, right? And so they can't experience those things. And so we kind of chuckle at that, but you know, there's all kinds of things like that, you know? A pen, uh, uh, some dirt, your shoes, you know? They can't feel pain, they can't express themselves. We know those things. And, and that's not a big deal, and that's why something like that makes us chuckle a little bit. But, it's interesting to me how some people approach God like they approach rock. I, I've noticed that some people, you know, they approach God as if God doesn't express himself. That, that God is, 
maybe he's there, and maybe he's powerful, and maybe he's somewhere, but he certainly doesn't express himself to us. In fact, uh, years ago, somebody kind of put it like this. It's kind of like a watch, and I know we're in a different era, but they used to have to wind up watches to make them work. But the idea was uh, God would kind of uh, wound up the watch and then just put it on the shelf and walked away. That God kind of got things going in the universe, created everything, but then just walked away. He doesn't express himself anymore. And so we kind of we treat God as if we would treat a, God, uh, a rock in the same way. There's other people that kind of look at God and go, well, yeah, God, I think God expresses himself, but only when he's mad. O- only when he, only kind of like when a parent, when, it, when a parent gets to the point where they've had enough, you, you know that, parents? You ever get to that point where you go, okay, I've had enough. And, and so some people view God like that, like this giant cosmic parent in the sky. And when God has had enough, that's when he expresses himself. But it's always in anger. And there's a lot of religions like that. They run around thinking that God is a God that has to be appeased because if we do anything wrong, he's just going to stomp on us, right? There's other people that think that God expresses himself on occasion, but, it, but it's only when I need something. It's only to go to him when I'm in dire straits or I really want something. And then God steps in to meet that need because God's primary purpose for existence is my happiness. And there's a lot of people that treat God that way, that, that God is there to make me healthy, wealthy, and wise. So unless I have a need, unless there's something particular I need to run to him for, I really really don't need him to express himself at all. And see, the, the reality is, folks, there are some people that even think that God just isn't even there, so he doesn't express himself because he's not real. And the reality for you and me as followers of Jesus Christ, we know that God expresses himself. But periodically, it's important that we're reminded about it. And we're reminded how he expresses himself. We talked to somebody just a few weeks ago, and that was one of their major contentions about God, that they had cried out to God in a certain time of their life, and God didn't answer them, and therefore, they weren't going to believe in him. And, And really what they were saying in that is, God did not do what I expected him to do. God did not express himself the way that I feel he should express himself. Therefore, I'm not going to believe in him. And so if if you're not familiar with that uh, or those ideas, they're very real. And 2,000 years ago, the writer of Hebrews was writing to some struggling followers of Jesus Christ who needed some reassurance and encouragement that God, in fact, had expressed himself and was expressing himself. They they needed to know that this, this relationship that they had begun with Jesus was worth continuing to do because they were thinking about backing out and so that's where these first three verses go and 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 we're going to look at those in just a minute but before we do since we weren't together last week we had a guest speaker last week I, i want to review just a little bit kind of bring us back in focus before we jump into this text remember hebrews the the what we call the book of hebrews is actually a letter Remember, it doesn't start out like most letters in the New Testament. There's no address. There's no greeting. It doesn't talk about the recipients. But it ends like a letter. And so we know it was written to a group of people, even though the author is unknown. We have no name of an author in there. We know that it was written by someone who had some very deep understanding of the Old Testament because he'll be quoting from the Old Testament all through this letter. And so the people that he's writing to, we assume, based on what we're seeing in in the letter, they were Jewish. They had very deep familiarity with the Old Testament scriptures. 
And the writer was writing specifically to these folks that had that knowledge. We also know that they were Christians. He calls them brothers and sisters all throughout the letter. And so these are folks that had come from the Jewish faith into Christianity, into the church. But remember, there was a problem, and that's why the letter was written. The problem was these folks had come up against some incredible struggles, persecution. There was a, a Caesar that was in charge of the Roman Empire at that time. His name was Nero. And Nero had zeroed in on the Christians for persecution. He was the guy that uh, put them in the, in the uh, Colosseum and had them eaten by uh, wild animals. He was the guy that had many of them crucified to mock the crucifixion of Christ and the person that they followed. And then we talked about the most horrendous way that he tortured them is he literally lit them up as human torches. And this was some of the stuff that these folks were facing in that day. And as a result, it was causing them to step back and go, whoa, wait a minute. We thought that the, that the king was going to bring the kingdom. Where is the king and where is his kingdom? All we're seeing is a whole lot of struggle and a whole lot of pain and a whole lot of persecution. Maybe, maybe this isn't the right thing. Maybe we should go back to our Jewish faith. And so these guys were struggling to know if they were really, on, in fact, on the right path. And so the, the author of Hebrews is writing to basically say, you are, you're on the right path. Don't turn around, don't go back. And, and it, this, is, this is kind of an apologetic, it's an argument for the fact that Christianity is the real deal. And the, 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 the uh, central figure of Christianity is who? Jesus. And so he spends all of his time focused on the person of Jesus Christ. And the goal is, he's telling them, listen, Jesus is better than all that other stuff. He's, he's better than the old sacrificial system. He's better than the priestly system. He's better than the prophets. He's better than the angels. He's better than all that stuff because Jesus is best. And that's the theme of Hebrews. And that's what he's going to continue to push all through this book. And he starts off right away in these first three verses. And I'm calling these, these foundational truths about God that they needed to have rehearsed. Let's look at it again. He says in verse 1, Long ago, God spoke many times in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. So again, no greeting, no dear so-and-so, no, hey, this is uh, so-and-so writing to you. Uh, I'm sitting here uh, in this city or this town or this jail. None of that stuff. He jumps right into the topic. And we talked about this before. It seems to me that he felt a sense of urgency. I, I, I don't want to get into all the, 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 the trivial greeting stuff here. I want to get right down to business. Some have even said that Hebrews reads more like a sermon than it does like a letter because he jumps right into the, to the situation at hand. He, he gets right in and he rehearses with them uh, three truths that are foundational for them to understand, and they're also foundational for Christianity just in general. They're important foundational truths for you and me. And in these three verses, we're going to see these three foundational truths that these folks needed to know and that we need to know. They're basic, but if we, if we don't go back and rehearse them on a regular basis, we'll begin to lose our way. And we may even become skeptical like these folks did. Two of these important truths are kind of implied, and he doesn't spend a lot of time uh, talking about them, but one of them is super important because it, 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 it's going to deal with the issue at hand for them. And I believe it's the central issue in, in most of our situations even today. So here we go. The first one is this. The first truth is this, and it's implied here, but the first is God is. God is, right? Notice, 
he starts off and he says, long ago, God. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't spend any time elaborating on that statement. He doesn't spend any time trying to convince them there is a God. Because remember, these are Jewish Christians. Even before they became Christians, they believed in God. They believed in the Old Testament. The Old Testament talked about God. So he's not going to spend a whole lot of time belaboring this point. But, but the, the reality is that because he's dealing with the Christian faith, Christ, the Christian faith begins at its very um, uh, smallest point in a belief that there is a God. By the way, the Bible never, you will not find any place in the Bible that tries to prove that there's a God. Somebody says, um, and I've had people ask me this before, hey, can you take me to a passage in, in the Bible where I can prove to my friend that there's a God? No, not specifically, because the Bible doesn't spend a whole lot of time trying to prove there's a God. It assumes everybody knows there's a God. I mean, think about it. The very first verse in the Bible, how does it start? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It, it doesn't start by saying, um, before we get into how we all got here, let's talk about how real and true God is. It assumes right from the very beginning, you all know there's a God, and let me tell you about this God. He is a creator, and this is the way he created. The Bible never tries to take time to prove that, because here's why. In everyone's heart, they know there's a God. Romans 1, 18. Listen to what it says. God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. Listen, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. What does that say? That says that within the heart of every human being is the knowledge that there is a God. Now, they may run after a, uh, that sense of a God and <clears throat> make an idol and worship that as their God, which is done a lot of times. They may uh, run after that sense inside of them that there's a God and write up their own ideas of what this God looks like and what he acts like and what he does, and that happens a lot. But the bottom line is we know that there's a God. You go, Rand, why is that inbred in us? Well, it goes all the way back to the first chapter of Genesis where it says that when God created people, he created them in his image. We have God's imprint, so to speak, on us. And inside, we know there's a God. See, there is, there is no such thing as an honest atheist. There's a lot of people around that'll run around and say that they don't believe in God. And they may have even gotten to a point that they've said it so much and fought against God so much that they start believing their own stuff, <clears throat> but deep down inside, they know there's a God. It's an amazing thing to me, the last, I don't know, maybe year, year and a half, some of the most prominent atheists uh, out there right now are saying some really weird stuff about how <clears throat> things like, well, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not so sure that Christianity has been all that bad for us. In fact, I, I kind of consider myself a cultural Christian. And, and what that means is they understand that Christianity has brought a lot of good things to the culture, like more morality. Uh, like kindness, like goodness. And so as they step back, they go, well, I'm not really sure I believe in God, but I kind of think that Christianity has been good for society. And it's like, okay, well, that's, that's good, and that's a step closer, but guess what? You can't have those good things about Christianity without having Christ. <laughs> the two go hand in hand, right? 
And so it could be that we'll see some of these folks, and, and I'm kind of watching to see, some of these folks we may hear real soon come to faith in Christ, uh, which would be pretty exciting. But what I think is happening with those folks is they're coming to grips with the reality that deep down inside they know there's a God. They know that this can't all be there. In fact, <laughs> they try so hard to say that there isn't a God, they end up saying some pretty ridiculous things. Let me give you an example of that. There, there's a, a, a famous atheist uh, who's still, still alive, still, as far as I know, he's an atheist. His name is Richard Dawkins. And Richard Dawkins wrote a book. He's written several books against uh, the idea of God, but he wrote a book uh, not too long ago called The Blind Watchmaker. And in the book, look what he says. Can you put that quote up there? He says, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. <laughs> and and, and if, you, if you can see that footnote down at the bottom, that comes off page one in the book. Now, he goes on to spend the rest of his book almost 500 pages trying to bolster this idea that, hey, it looks like there's design, but it just looks like that. There's not really design. Seriously, that's what he spends the rest of his book saying, look, it, it, you would think when you look at a flower and it's got you know, symmetry and beauty and it looks like it has design, it's not really designed. And then he goes on to try to explain that. Folks, <laughs> that's really sad. When you take something so, so, so basically obvious that you have to spend so much time trying to say that something isn't what it is, because you don't want to say that there's a God who has made us with purpose and beauty, right? Now, the, the reality is, according to Romans chapter 1, and according to just common sense, when we look at design in nature, it screams to us that there's a God. It doesn't give us all the facts about God. But it does give us some basic things, right? When we, for instance, when we look at something like a flower that has beauty and symmetry. It, it tells us whoever created this is a God of beauty and, and a God of artistry and a God of design, right? When we, when we uh, read and see some of the things like uh, uh, the power out there just in space, atomic power and different things like that, we go, wow, whoever put this together and designed it, I may not know a whole lot about him, but I can at least come to the conclusion he's powerful, right? So when we look at nature, we get some basic ideas about God. He's expressed himself through what he's made, but it doesn't give us detail. We can't get detail about uh, God unless he tells us that detail, right? But we get the basic idea that he's there. Creation is a way that God has expressed himself. Even though it's limited, it's a way that he's expressed himself. And so the author of Hebrews just starts out and he says, long ago, God. And that brings us to the second important point. God speaks. He said, long ago, God spoke. Many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. God spoke. See, God could have just created and said, I'm done. See you guys later. Figure it out. God could have revealed himself in the limited way that he has, just in what he made, and said, okay, you figure it out from there. But he didn't. He spoke. He gave specifics about himself and about us and about how we can relate to, to him. And again, the author of Hebrews doesn't take a whole lot of time talking about this because these folks believed that. They believed in the Old Testament. They believed that God had spoken. They believed that God had expressed himself through the spoken word. And we, we see in Scripture, in the Old Testament, that he started speaking right from the very beginning. If you go to that first chapter of Genesis, what do you see over and over again? And God said let there be, right? 
Eight times in the first chapter of Genesis alone, we see God speaking everything into existence. We see right from the get-go that God is just not a creator God. He's a speaking God. He expresses himself through the spoken word. He spoke, uh, this passage says, through the prophets. God's word came through different prophets. As we go through the Old Testament, a prophet was simply a person who spoke for God. Now, a lot of times <clears throat> you talk about a prophet, and the first thing people think of is that a prophet foretold the future. That a prophet was this guy that says, well, oh, this is going to happen, right? And so we get this idea. In fact, a lot of people um, uh, that talk about the gift of prophecy today, that's how they define it, as a person who tells you something that's going to happen in your future. But that was not the primary ministry of the prophet in the Old Testament. He did some of that. But his primary ministry, the thing that made him a prophet, is he was God's spokesperson. He spoke for God. It, it wasn't always about this, was, this is what's going to happen for sure. Many times it was, this is what's going to happen if you don't do this. This is what God will do if you do do this. So it wasn't a hard and fast prediction of the future. It was a call to repent, to turn back to God. And that's what the prophets were for. The prophets were to point the people toward God who is the best. And so the, the author of Hebrews brings them back to this idea that, hey, God has spoken. We know he's spoken through the prophets. And, and, and he did it, did it in all kinds of different ways, right? You think about Moses. How did God speak to Moses? And then God, uh, Moses spoke to the people. Well, he showed up first in a burning bush, right? Well, that sounds like a various way to me. How about uh, a prophet like Elijah? Elijah hears God in one particular scene that we see in a still small voice. Yep. God whispers to him, right? Then we see a guy like Ezekiel. If you look at Ezekiel's prophecy, <clears throat> prophecy, we see a guy who's seeing visions. And then he takes those visions and he explains them to the people. So God's taking this different idea of visions and using that to speak to him. Daniel, if you read Daniel's prophecy, he's having dreams. And he sees in his dreams these pretty elaborate things. That, that hook up with end times prophecy that we see going on in the book of Revelation. So all these different prophets, God spoke, it says, in various ways. But what do we see through that? Again, it goes back to the idea that God is a communicating God. God speaks. And all through this letter, we, we see several times where the author links what is going on in the Old Testament with the Holy Spirit speaking. Let me give you just an example. In uh, chapter 3, he's going to quote from Psalm 95, and he, just before he quotes from Psalm 95, he says this, that is why the Holy Spirit says, and then he quotes Psalm 95. Another example is in Hebrews uh, chapter 10. There he's going to quote from the prophet Jeremiah, and before he quotes from Jeremiah, he says, and the Holy Spirit also testifies this, and then he speaks from the Old Testament. See, the author of, the Old, uh, the author of Hebrews believed very, very surely that the Old Testament was God speaking himself, and he was reminding these folks, God has spoken to us. Then he says this, and this is very key, and this is where his thought begins to pivot. Then he says, now, in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. Now, it's very interesting because, because in the original Greek, there's no his there. It literally says this, in these last days, God has spoken to us through son, the Son is this, this incredible means that God has used to speak. See, we many times get this idea, and it's true, but, but it's not the only thing that's true. We get this idea that God sent Jesus just to die for us. And that's true. 
But that's not the only thing that's true. God sent Jesus to speak to us. God, Jesus is God's communication to us. And, and look what it says here. He says, in these final days. And you might look at that and you go, wait a minute, that was written 2,000 years ago. How could those be the final days? The final days are anything from the time that Jesus came, born in the manger, and his second coming. Everything in between, Scripture talks about as being the final days. So somebody will come, uh, sometimes I, I, people come to me and go, you think we're living in the last days? Yep, sure do. And I know what they mean. They really mean, do you think we're living in the last of the last days? Right? And I think that too. <laughs> but we are living, according to Scripture, we are in the final days. The final days, the king showed up. He demonstrated that he was a perfect sacrifice for sin. He made that sacrifice for sin, and he left. And he said, I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to establish my kingdom. So from the time he came until the time he comes back the second time, we're in the last days. And that's what the author's talking about. He says, in these last days, God has spoken through the Son. Now, when he says that, that God spoke through Jesus in these last days, he's not saying, so, so forget about the Old Testament. You don't have to read the Old Testament anymore. It's not relevant anymore. Only Jesus is relevant. And I've met people like that. You know, I really like the Bible. That I, I don't ever read the Old Testament. I only read the New Testament. Let me tell you something. You're not going to understand the New Testament unless you know, know the Old Testament. You for sure are not going to understand Hebrews unless you read the Old Testament. I'll go a step further. You won't understand the book of Revelation and still, until you understand the book of Genesis. There's a reason that Genesis is the start and Revelation is the finish. There's a reason for that. It wasn't just a, oh, well, let's, let's throw Revelation in at the end and Genesis at the beginning. There's a reason Genesis is first and Revelation is last. And you cannot understand Revelation unless you know what's going on in Genesis. And so to say, well, you know, I don't really like the Old Testament that much. So I just read the New Testament. I say, that's too bad because you're missing out on a ton. When, when the author says here that um, God spoke through his son, he's not saying, don't listen to the Old Testament anymore. Really? What he's saying is the Old Testament isn't complete. It's incomplete. It's kind of like this, maybe. I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but you're watching a show, and as you're watching the show, it's, it's like, you know, a lot of action and, 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 and suspense and stuff's going on, and you're going, man, how is this going to end? How are they going to bring this thing to an end? And, and, and you keep kind of looking at your clock, maybe, and you got, they got to bring this to an end pretty soon. I mean, how are they going to do this? And then all of a sudden, the screen goes black, and across the screen, those words, dreaded words, to be continued. <laughs> And you go, oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding me. I gotta know what's going on, right? It's part one. And you're going, oh my goodness, I need, I need to know what's happening. And so until you can watch the next one, you know, I mean, it used to be there, you know, there was no Netflix or Prime or anything like that. So you had to wait at least another week. But even worse than that, maybe you can remember this. If they did that at the end of the season, you remember that? where the last show of the season ended like that, and you're going, you got to be kidding me. It's May, and i got to wait till September to find out what happened? And you're just like, oh, my goodness. And they got you hooked, right? That's kind of like what happens in Scripture. You get to the end of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, by the way, it's Malachi. It's not Malachi, the Italian prophet. It's Malachi. And you get to the end, you get to the end of the Old Testament, and he's promised, hey, look, the Messiah is coming. In fact, let me tell you this. There is one who is coming before him in the spirit of Elijah who will prepare his way. In other words, he's saying there's going to be a prophet. That'll be your cue. This prophet's going to come on scene, and he's going to prepare the way, and Messiah's coming. And then you know what happens? God goes silent. It's almost like to be continued. And the people in the Old Testament are going, wait, no. No. Now, it, it wasn't a season. It was 400 years 
of silence. God stopped speaking. And the people clamored and they looked and they hoped and they strayed further and further. But God didn't speak because he had been speaking over and over and over again. And he'd been calling the people back to repentance and they didn't repent. And so finally God said, I'm done. And for 400 years, he went silent. And then all of a sudden, an angel showed up to a guy named Zachariah. And as Zachariah is serving in the temple by himself, this angel appears and says, Zachariah, your wife Elizabeth's going to have a baby. Oh, I know she's past childbearing years. She's an old woman. But God's going to do a miraculous thing, and she's going to have a baby. And Zachariah, you're going to name that baby John. What a great name. What a great name. <laughs> <laughs> and we know him as John the Baptist. And the angel told Zechariah, he'll be the one that the prophet spoke about who will prepare the way for Messiah. Well, then shortly after that, another angel shows up. God was speaking again. And this time he spoke to a young virgin named Mary and said, Mary, a miraculous thing will happen to you. You will conceive by way of the Holy Spirit, and you will have a son, and you will call him Son of the Most High. And then another angel showed up to a bunch of shepherds in a field, and they spoke, and they said, hey, get up and go to Bethlehem. Because a Savior has been born for you. And God began to speak. And listen to how John in his gospel describes it. He starts off, he gives this introduction as he starts off and he says this, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And then he explains, so the Word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. God spoke, and he called that speaking his Son, the living Word. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, God has spoken spoken to us through his son. Now, why would that be important to these folks? Because what they were thinking about leaving was Christianity. And the central figure in Christianity is Jesus. And they needed to know that this Jesus wasn't just some guy that said some nice things about the kingdom and maybe we should follow him. You need to know that this Jesus was the completed word from the Old Testament that hung silent for 400 years. He's the one. And you're not, you're not missing out. You're not, you haven't picked up on the wrong thing. This is truth. And from there, he's going to go on. And our third point is this. Not only God is, God has spoke, Jesus is God. He has to absolutely establish in their hearts and their minds that this Jesus is God himself. And, and he does this by giving seven uh, essential characteristics of Jesus. He, he kind of he spits off real quick just these credentials. And these first three verses, folks, are the absolute foundation of the rest of the book of Hebrews. What he does from this point on, after these three verses, is he's, he's just going to elaborate on all these different things that he lays out in these three verses. So the rest of the book, he's just going to zero in and make more what he said in these seven essential things. We don't have time to go into them real deep. We will a little bit more as we go through the book. But listen to what he says. 
He first of all says, God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance. Your translation may say something like that um, God appointed him as heir. And so this is, this is what we have. He is the heir. Well, what's, what's an heir? When you think of somebody who inherits something, what do they inherit, in, inherit from whoever it is they're inheriting it from? Whatever that person has, right? I mean, if, if, if you've written in your will an inheritance and you, you write out specific things to somebody, you're writing to them whatever you have to that individual. Jesus, Scripture says, is the heir of God. What does that mean? That means he owns everything. It's all his. God has said, you are the heir. It's all yours. We talked about this um, uh, several months back, the idea that since God created, he owns everything. God made Jesus creator and Lord. Jesus owns it all. It's all his. He goes on and he says this. Um, Through the Son, he created the universe. So we see from this, the author of Hebrews is saying that Jesus is creator. He made it all. Very interesting. Let me point this out to you because I think this this is super important. There's two words in the Greek that's usually translated uh, uh, world or creation. And it's the word cosmos, right? And, and we've, we're kind of familiar with that word probably. Cosmos just means like the earth and the, uh, the stars and the moon and all that. That's usually what we think of with cosmos. There's another word, it's the word ionos. And ionos means all of uh, what cosmos means plus more. It has to do with time, the ages, uh, they used to say. In other words, when they used this word, they wanted people to understand that it's not just material things that were made. It was space and time and everything that's everything that we know. This was a full, complete word and it says that, that when Jesus, when God created, he created through Jesus everything. Space, time, matter, absolutely everything. Paul said it like this in Colossians 1.16. Talking about Jesus, he said, Through him, God created everything in the heavenly realm and on earth. And then he goes further. Listen to what he says. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers. What is that? Well, there are thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the world that we know, but look what it says, in the unseen world. He's talking about a realm you and I can't see, a spiritual realm. Christ created uh, angels and all the uh, angelic beings, and it says everything was created through him and for him. So the author of Hebrews wants these guys to understand, look, this Jesus, he owns it all, he created it all, and then he says this, the Son radiates God's own glory. Jesus radiates or perfectly shows us God's glory. Now this is super important because because the word there, radiates, it's only used here in Hebrews. It doesn't mean reflect. See, you and I are supposed to reflect God as his image bearers. Jesus radiates, different word. You say, what's the difference between radiating and reflecting? To radiate means you are actually a part of that which you're radiating. All right, think about it this way. The sun radiates light, right? The light is part of the sun. It's not separate from the sun. It's a part of the sun. So when it says that Jesus radiates the glory of God, it's not that that Jesus is this separate being who's reflecting like you and I reflect God or supposed to reflect God. He literally is with God and part of God and radiates God is what he's saying. It's a specific thing he's trying to get across to these folks. In fact, Again, let me go back to, to John and his gospel. And, and we saw this a minute ago. The word became human, made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, 
the glory of the Father's one and only Son. What's it saying? When you see the glory and the majesty of Jesus, you are seeing the glory and the majesty of God. That's what it's saying. And these, these readers of Hebrews, these Old Testament Jewish believers, would have understood this claim that he was making here. Then he says this, the Son expresses the very character of God. Again, your translation, translation may be a little bit different, but the word there is, was a word used to imprint. It was used to, uh, uh, for a king example, if he made a decree, many times they would melt hot wax on the document where the decree was, and the king had a signet ring, and he would take that ring that had his uh, symbol on it, and he would press that into the hot wax, and it would leave that imprint in the hot wax, and it was, it was uh, notification to anybody reading this that this is the king's word. This symbol, this sign, this imprint is the king speaking, is what it meant. Another way that that word would have been used is they would take hot metal, and if they wanted the impression of, let's say, the Caesar or whoever was ruling, and they wanted to put it on that coin, they would stamp it in that hot metal, and the impression would be on there. And what that basically was saying is that this coin is owned by this Caesar. You, you just get to borrow it, but it's owned by him. And see that imprint on there? That proves that that's his. That's the word that's used here, that Jesus expresses the very character of God. And the word character there literally means essence. You say, what, is, what does essence mean? It means the core of who you are. Jesus is the imprint of the core of who God is. That's what this is saying. Let me illustrate it by going back to the Gospels. So, Jesus is getting ready to, to be arrested, and he's meeting with his uh, disciples, his closest followers, in the upper room. You guys know the, the, the scene? And they have, eventually, they have what we call the Last Supper together. And so Jesus is telling them that he's going to go away. In John 14, we read about this whole scene, and Jesus tells him um, that, that he's going to go away, but don't worry, because I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And, and when I go, I'm going to come back and get you and take you unto myself. And they're listening to all this, and they're still, they're still trying to figure out, what, what is he talking about? Gee, going away and, and doing these different things. And, and Philip says this in, in John 14, 8. Philip says to him, Lord, just show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. Look, God, God hey, just show us God and everything will be great. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus replied, I've been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Do you understand what a statement that is? Jesus was saying, Philip, Philip. You could almost see him grab him by the shoulders and shake him, maybe slap him in the face. Of the, Philip, I'm the guy. You want to see the Father? I'm right here. I am the impression. I am the essence. I am the character of the one you want to see. That's what I've been showing you the three years that I've been here. That's exactly what Jesus was telling Philip. That's what the author of Hebrews is telling these folks. Listen, Jesus is the guy. You, you don't want to turn your back on him. You don't want to walk away from this thing of Christianity. If you walk away from Christianity, you're walking away from Jesus. You are walking away from the very character, essence, holiness of God himself. That's what he's saying here. Then he says this. He sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. He's the sustainer of everything. And what does that mean? It means he holds everything together. Now, <laughs> this is very interesting, too, because of the the grammar here, it's, it's not in the past tense that he sustained it and then just kind of maybe like we would, like if you glued something together and you walked away from it, you'd go, hey, the glue's holding together. Uh, did you do that? Yes, I did. So I'm technically, I'm the sustainer of that because I glued it to, that's not, it's not past tense. 
the, 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 the grammar here is he is right now presently sustaining everything. Do you, do you understand the implications of that? The implication is this. At any time, he could say, I'm done sustaining it. And everything just falls apart. You know, we, we talk about things like, wow, you know, you think God's going to blow everything up someday? He doesn't have to. All, he's, he, all he has to do is stop sustaining it with his command. That's it. You go, what's that look like? I don't want to find out. <laughs> but, 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 the, but the point is, the author of Hebrews wants them to understand that this Jesus that you're thinking about walking away from, you need to understand, not only did he create everything, not only is he the impression and the essence of God, this Jesus holds everything together, including you right now in this very moment. Amen. Colossians 1.17 says it like this. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. And then the author says this. When he had cleansed us from our sins. What does that mean? That means this Jesus is Savior. He's the Savior. He cleansed us from our sins. Nobody did that in the Old Testament. The, the priest the best the priest could do was make an offering and kind of kick the can down the road where God would say, okay, that's good enough for this year, but you're going to need to do it again next year. And so there was never an offering in the Old Testament that cleansed from sin. It only covered sin. It's kind of like your credit card. When you make the bare minimum payment on it, you can't walk away and say, well, I paid off my debt. No, you kick the can down the road till next month. You've incurred some interest along the way, but the debt's still there. Somewhere along the line, you're going to have to decide if you or somebody else is going to be able to pay your debt. And the Old Testament was kind of like a credit card where it just got kicked down the road because there was never a sacrifice that was uh, sufficient to cleanse the people from sin. And what we're going to see in Hebrews is that was Jesus. That's what he came to do. And so the author makes a, uh, a kind of a, a brief statement about that real, uh, real quick right here when he says that he cleansed us from our sin. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, God made Christ, who never sinned, to the, be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Jesus. That's what the author of Hebrews is talking about. And then he says this, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. What's he saying? He's saying that this one that you're thinking about walking away from, you need to understand right as we get started, and, and I'm going to talk about this more as I write to you, but right as you get, we get started here, you need to understand that he is king. He is absolutely king. Sitting at the right hand was a, was a position of authority and power. And he's going to repeat this several times in his letter. He's going, to, he's going to go back to this idea of Jesus sitting at the right hand, this authority and this power. And it stresses that this Jesus is king. That's what they were looking for. That's what they wanted from the Old Testament. They wanted a Messiah, a savior king that was going to step in and make all wrongs right. And, and when we see Jesus' ministry, that's what we see. When you see Jesus healing, it's, it's not just to heal folks because he feels sorry for them. He does. He does feel sorry for them, and he does want to heal them. Scripture tells us over and over again he had compassion for them, but that was not the sole reason that he did it. He didn't just do it so that we would go, wow, he can do some pretty crazy things. Maybe he can save us too. He did do it for that, but not just for that. What he was doing was he was showing, look, things are not the way they're supposed to be, but when the king finally arrives, this is how they'll look. No more disease, no more blindness, no more sin. He was giving us a glimpse of what it looks like to be in the kingdom. And so when he talks about Jesus being the king, remember, these are Jewish folks thinking about bailing, and he's saying, look, don't do it. 
This is the king you've been waiting for. It's not right right now. You're struggling right now. You're going through persecution right now. But this one is the king. And you go, okay. That's good. I get that. But that was 2,000 years ago. I'm not Jewish. Most of us. I found out somebody, some, some more folks in here are than I thought. But anyway, um, most of us aren't. So what on earth does this have to do with us? And let me give you two things as we close out this morning. Number one is this. God has expressed himself. And he's expressed himself to you. See, this isn't just about these folks 2,000 years ago. This is a message for you and me. This Jesus, he's the real deal. He is all these things that the author is pointing out. This Jesus is God's word to us. This is his expression to us of him. He expressed all the grace, all the mercy, all the love, all the goodness, all the power. This Jesus is all of that, and he's that to you. It's, it's not just a story that we're reading to some, about some folks 2,000 years ago. God has expressed himself to you you and to me. He said, this is who this Jesus is. And so as we go through this, pull yourself into the reality that although it was written to them, it's for us. All right? And here's number two. Jesus is all you need. That's what he's trying to tell these folks. Look, I, I know you're going through struggles. I know it's scary. I know that some of you may end up dying, but I want you to know that no matter what happens, Jesus is best, and that means he's absolutely all you need. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time latching on to that sometimes. You know, when I see stuff that's going on in my life and things that I'm facing, when I look at the world and see what's going on in the world, sometimes I have a hard time coming back to this anchor of truth that Jesus really is the best and he's all that I need because it's scary sometimes and it's painful sometimes and there's big questions most of the time because God doesn't owe us answers. In fact, a lot of the answers that God could give us, we wouldn't understand anyway. So it's kind of like, what's the point of him wasting his time, right? Trust me. And so these folks needed to understand, listen, Jesus is the right thing. Don't bail on him. And you know what? Ultimately, this Jesus is all you need. He is the one that you're hoping for and needing, right? Listen, all of that, if, if, if you could say, okay, what is, what is, uh, what is this guy going to talk about as we go through Hebrews? It's right there in those three verses. Everything else is going to spring out of those three verses. And what's he saying? Jesus is best. It also means this. If that's true, and I believe that it is, then he has expressed himself to you. Jesus is all you need. And if you've never placed your faith and trust in him, you're missing. You're missing the best. You're you're missing the one who's all you need. You're missing the one who wants to continue to express himself specifically to you. He wants to have a relationship with you. You go, man, I don't understand all of that. Yeah, it's crazy when you stop and think about the God who created everything, knows everything about you, and he wants to have relationship with you. Jesus came to provide that connection so that you can have a relationship with the God of the universe. If you've never understood that this God loves you, that Jesus came for you, man, Take him. Grab a hold of him. 
He is all of this and even more. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? Listen. As we go through Hebrews, we're, we're going to see Jesus just getting bigger and better. Um, not, because, not because the guy who wrote this makes Jesus that way. He, he just realizes that that's what Jesus is. And so he, he just elaborates on who he is. Because these folks are not sure. They're, they're, they're wondering. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and maybe, I don't know, maybe in your mind you've just kind of wondered... You know, there's a lot of things out there. There's a lot of different beliefs out there. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if this Jesus is the real deal or not. Listen, there, there's so many things that point to the reality that he is. But the, the greatest thing is that this God has spoken to us. He's, he's spoken right from the very beginning. When he put this all together, he spoke in nature itself, saying, I'm here, I'm here. And he's given us these general ideas of who he is in nature. He, he's an he's a artistic God. He's a designer God. He is a, he's a God of power. He's a, he's a God of intelligence. And, and through creation, he has spoken to us. <clears throat> but then he didn't stop there. He went further and he spoke to us through the prophets, through his word. He gave us his word, the Old Testament. And in that, he told us about who we are as people created in his image. He told us where things went bad, where, where sin entered the picture and, and caused just all kinds of destruction and ruin. And then he tells us how he's going to fix it and what he wants from us. And then... He spoke to us through his son, through Jesus. The promised one who came to pay that price for our sin so that we could have that debt forgiven that just kept getting kicked down the road. Jesus was that word. And he's spoken. And it's for you. And he's all you need. Lord, thank you for this reminder. I pray first, Lord, for those that, that are just maybe wrestling with this right now. If they were honest, they would say, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in Jesus, but I'm, I'm not really sure I've come to that place where I'm trusting him as my savior. I pray, Lord, if they're, if they're not there yet, <laughs> please keep working on their heart, keep massaging their heart, Bring them to that point where they understand how much you love them and how amazing Jesus is and help them to come to that point where they just embrace him fully as, as Savior, as God, as King. Lord, for those of us that, that do know you, we would say, yeah, you know, I've done that. I've, I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. I believe that he's paid the debt for my sin. Lord, help us to be reminded of how amazing that is and how amazing you are. We get so caught up with life and stuff that we just, we have a tendency to, to not rehearse the wonderful things about who you are and what you've done. As we go through this book of Hebrews, continue to remind us of the amazing truth of your greatness and the fact that you are the best. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.